Some authors write about American pioneer life in the Midwest in the 1800s. And some authors write about complicated romantic entanglements. But what is it that you write about? Well, I write about things that go bump in the night or sometimes also in the day. Just looking at your book covers, it's clear you are drawn to all things creepy, scary, and ghostly. And you've successfully turned your interest into a writing career. And one of the places you go to in Burlington to tell your scary stories is on St. Paul Street. And it's one of the oldest buildings in town. And it has a very dark basement with a very dark history. That's right. So this uh, building, which now houses uh, what I call the most haunted restaurant in the state of Vermont, it's the American Flatbread Company. We've got some incredible tales that I've been told at the end of Queen City Ghost Walk routes and that people have sent me emails and we've heard word of mouth uh, anecdotally. One of the stories I know is about a restaurant that was housed in that building and it was called the Biltmore Grill. Now when that restaurant existed for a couple of years there, one of the managers said that servers who were female were not allowed to go down into the basement alone, no ifs, ands, or buts, because when female servers would go downstairs, often they'd find themselves pinched or pushed, or maybe they'd have their hair pulled hard by somebody they couldn't see. This young woman said she couldn't believe the prohibition on female servers going down alone. And one day, one of her tables, one of the parties, asked for something and she realized they didn't have it upstairs. She figured, by the time I get down there and back up again, no one will know I've gone. So she went down the stairs and when she got to the bottom of the stairs, the lights went out and then she heard the sound of something heavy, metallic, being dragged across the floor toward her. She said that she was startled and she moved away from the walk-in cooler. She'd had her hand there as kind of a, a placeholder so she knew where she was. And that's when she felt cold, rough hands reaching up her skirt and grasping her thighs. She told me she pulled herself away, fell on the floor like a bug and rolled over and crawled in an attempt to get back to the stairs. She said she finally made it, scraping her shins and skinning her knees, and when she got to the top and flung open the door to the restaurant, everything looked perfectly normal, except people were looking at her like she'd lost her mind because she looked a mess. What do you think when you hear stories like that? Well, I think that there is a whole lot of paranormal angst still going on in a place uh, like that one, which has existed since the early 1800s. There are definitely these spirits that are still residing inside. We've heard stories, uh, different stories about things that have happened in that building. We've heard from tenants who live upstairs in the building that the paranormal activity doesn't stop at the first floor. I know that some of your books have stories about haunted buildings in Burlington and around Lake Champlain, but you also write about a haunted railroad crossing. That's true. Back in 1901, there was a young woman named Marie Blay who had come from Canada looking for a job at the Queen City Cotton Company. She'd brought her sister and a dear friend. One night, they were headed back to their evening shift when the skies opened up and it began to pour down rain. Uh, the women were drenched, their hair was being whipped out of the buns that held it by the strong wind, and Marie Blay's sister and friend managed to get across the tracks just fine. But poor Marie Blay, we don't know whether she caught her skirt, but suddenly there was the Rutland and Burlington train headed right toward her. She slipped. The engineer saw her, he couldn't stop. She threw her arms up over her face as though that might protect her or do something. Um, but the engineer hit her and threw her 75 feet into the air, killing her instantly. People in the neighborhood and in the factory missed Marie Blay so desperately because she was quite a little character, always singing, talking, gossiping. But they didn't have to miss her long because it wasn't long before her ghost was seen in the neighborhood and in the factory and there on the railroad tracks. Uh, the night watchman said that after everyone had left the second shift, there he would be walking through the building and suddenly he'd hear the sound of Marie Blaise loom starting up and he would find her there in that room working with her eyes wild and her hair a mess. The poor engineer who hit her, he quit his job. He went and told his supervisors that whenever he drove that route from the south, he would get to the tracks there where he'd hit Marie Blay, and suddenly it would look like there was an obstacle looming. There was maybe a large steamer trunk or a boulder, and so he'd slow the train down. And then when he got to that spot, there beside the tracks would be Marie Blay staring at him. He said it was like hitting her over and over again. Now, 
An interesting thing about that neighborhood is, I've done some interviews with people there in, in the various houses, and they tell me that in late June, on the anniversary of Marie Blaise's death, the modern train will go through, and they'll hear the bells, they'll hear all of the warning signals. But sometimes, if they listen closely, they can hear the sound of a young woman's scream. Well, our station is located in Plattsburgh, New York, and in your book, Ghosts and Legends of Lake Champlain, you have a story about a murder in Plattsburgh. That's right. Back in the late 1800s, on the July 4th holiday, a man named Owen O'Neill was traveling back to his home just outside Plattsburgh. He'd been running some errands on Cornelia Street. And as he rode in his horse and buggy along the way, um, people who were living on either side of the road began to hear these strange moaning sounds. They could hear the sound of a horse passing by, you know, the, the jingling of the buggy, and they could hear uh, these terrible groans coming from outside, but it was late at night, and thinking it was simply someone who'd had a little too much to drink celebrating the July 4th holiday, they rolled over and went back to sleep. Well, uh, it was discovered later on in the morning as the sun came up by Owen O'Neill's wife and his young teenage son that the sounds people heard that night had been the sounds of Owen O'Neill slowly dying on his route home. There had been some foul play, and he had been stuffed underneath the carriage of his wagon, and so on his way home, he had been slowly ground to death by the wheel and the axle. So he was calling out in agony, just groaning, and these people in their homes were hearing these awful noises. Yes, yes, it's true. And it, you know, you, you think hindsight being 2020 or whatever. I mean, if only someone had thought, wait, that's peculiar. And it's a traveler so late at night, but uh, nobody did. And so poor Owen O'Neill, there he was. His clothes had been worn away and he'd basically just been killed slowly um, on, his, on his way back to, to his place. Well, you are certainly knowledgeable about these spooky subjects. And in 2002, you actually started an unusual tour of Burlington, Vermont. What kind of tour is this? Well, it's Queen City Ghost Walk, and it's Burlington's first and favorite haunted tour. Uh, yes, after a year of research, after a visit to Salem, Massachusetts, I started Queen City Ghost Walk, and we have been scaring up history in the city of Burlington ever since. Well, you have these very successful tours in Burlington, and you've written this wonderfully successful book series on the ghosts and the gruesome happenings. I imagine that authors such as yourself who have successful series sometimes get asked, how did you get started and how did you get published? It's true, and a lot of people will get in touch with me via Facebook or they'll send me an email, and they'll be aspiring authors and they'll, they'll wanna know how to get in touch with uh, different people so that they can get their books into print. And I have to say that I am not a huge help to them because in 2008, the History Press, uh, my publisher got in touch with me and said, hey, we hear you've got a ghost walk in Burlington, Vermont. We don't have a haunted Burlington. Would you write it for us? So you were approached to write books. How did they even know you could write at all? Well, I think that there was some assumption on the part of the publisher since I had a ghost tour and ghost tours require some amount of scripting that I could probably put a book together for them. And I have to say, it's one of my favorite books I've written for them, but I had no template, didn't really know uh, exactly where I was going with it, only knew that I had about eight stories already from my Queen City Ghost Walk tours. And fleshing that out, I ended up with a book. You've also written a book for the very young and impressionable reader who was discovered in the sock drawer. Well, there's a little creature named Zula discovered in Lucy's drawer. In my book, there's a witch in my sock drawer. What's she doing in the sock drawer? Well, she is spiriting away socks. You see, the, the thing that people don't realize when their socks go missing is that sometimes little witches are, are at fault. Um, and you really can't blame them, though, because it's part of their witch training, uh, and they just shrink themselves down. They spend some time in your home, and when you go searching around in your washer or dryer and you find that you used to have two of a pair and you only have one, you have often a little characters like Zula to thank for that. <laughs> so how do you enjoy writing for children? 
I love writing for children, and I uh, that was one thing that when uh, I was younger, say high school and college age, I would pen these little stories, and they really didn't go uh, any farther than maybe my sock drawer. You know, I'd put them away, and with this one, I just couldn't really shake the characters. I loved the idea that Lucy had this little witch friend who was going to help her out on Halloween, and I really loved the idea that the story had a moral, which is keep your room clean. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what is going to happen uh, and, uh, and who may need to help you out if you don't. Well, parents are going to love that moral. Oh, good. What is satisfying about a good, scary story? Well, there are a lot of different theories, but I think that it allows you to feel afraid in a way that's safe. Um, I don't know whether you know this or not, but after the last of uh, what we called the Great Recession, there was an uptick in people watching shows on television, on the cable channels. There were all of these different ghost investigation stories, and that allowed people with all of these turbulent uh, and scary things going on in the world to feel afraid in a way that felt visceral but didn't impact their everyday life, <laughs> you know? So uh, that kind of being afraid, I think, has been popular for generations. I think we've had scary stories and ghost stories since the beginning of time, and I think we will always have them. Spotlight is supported by the Glenn and Carol Pearsall Adirondack Foundation, dedicated to improving the quality of life for year-round residents of the Adirondack Park.